Good morning and welcome to Ethnos. We are so glad that you could join us today. Uh, we are coming to you live from the University City neighborhood of San Diego, California. Uh, and we are glad that you can join us no matter where you are from because here at Ethnos, uh, we seek to be a community for all peoples 
uh, who are moved by the love of Jesus to transform UTC, which is our local neighborhood, San Diego, and the entire world. And so you are a part of it, uh, no matter who you are, where you're from, or even when you're joining us. I know some of you guys are uh, watching this in recording, uh, but we also love seeing all the people who are on, on time, live on Sunday mornings. Uh, we would love to see that back in person too, uh, to have this many people at the beginning of service. That would be great. Uh, but for this morning, we got a couple of things that we are excited about. Uh, we are continuing the second part um, of our message on racism. And so we will be talking about that in a moment, how we recover and heal, um, the different roles that we have to play in that. We're also going to be praying in the middle of our service for a local business uh, owner. And we'll be pray praying for uh, all of our local small businesses in the area. Uh, but to start off, we are going to join together in musical worship to sing uh, to Jesus, the one who makes it possible for us to join together with one another in community and also with God. Uh, worship is both upward and outwards, as Eric would say. Uh, and so we are going to be singing about the God who uh, has the power to bring us freedom, to bring justice in this. Uh, and so uh, you can stand up, uh, you can move around however you would like to do it uh, as we join together in singing these first two songs. Ethnos, you ready for this? Faith Hill Band, you ready for this? Julia, you ready for this? Okay, here we go. Hey. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless? The King of all kings. This, this, this is amazing grace. Come on, everybody. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. you've done for me. Hey, has he done anything for you? Julia, has he done anything for you? Tell us about it. Hey, come on. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The king of glory, the king of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like Anything for you to say Worthy is the Lamb who was slain And worthy is the King who conquered the grave Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered Julia, can you say it? Say Worthy is the Lamb who was slain He alone is worthy Oh, yes, he is Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Sing it again, sing say Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Oh, yes, worthy is the King you are. who washed Sing my out, sins worthy away. Is the lamb. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Yeah, yeah. Worthy is the King who conquered. Sing it one more time. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. Peace. 
God, put your hands together. Oh, 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 oh yeah. I am set free. <laughs> Sea la honra y el poder 
Santo, Santo eres tú, tú eres Santo. Thanks for joining us in singing. Let's pray to our God. God, it truly is you who sits on the throne. It is you uh, who has created this world. You are the God who is patient and kind and loving, who has changed our lives uh, by defeating the powers of darkness. And so we look to you and we honor you and we worship you. Help us high and exalted in our lives. And in the Give you all the honor and power. Well, thank you again. If you guys love those songs, uh, you can always find them on our Ethnos YouTube channel. Uh, and so the videos are up there each week. Um, Ethmos kids, you guys are free to go. Uh, thanks for joining us with the singing. Um, but you guys can join uh, your classes on Zoom. Uh, if you would like the link for that uh, and you have some kids at home that would love to be a part of that, uh, let us know in the chat and we'll make sure we get the info to you. Uh, for everyone else, uh, we're going to take a quick moment uh, to encourage you to say hi to some people this morning. You can do that either in our comment section on Facebook because we are live and I will look in there in a second. You can also do that by texting a friend, a family member, a coworker, a neighbor, uh, to just let them know that you're thinking about them this morning. Um, say hello, ask them how they are doing. Uh, yeah, God and his love isn't just for us, uh, but it's to be shown in care for other people as well. And during this season, it's important as ever to try to stay connected uh, and be that for other people as well. Not, I know we need that for ourselves. So I'm going to hop into our comment section and say hello. I know a lot of you guys have already been in there. Another thing that you can do is, uh, you can do this every week, uh, is to comment or to like or to share our live stream. Uh, it lets other people know that you are watching. It lets Facebook know that we're popular, as popular as we are. And then uh, it also helps uh, enjoy, invite other people in. Um, and so I want to say good morning to all the people here in chat. There's a lot of people. You guys were already saying hi, which is great. Uh, good morning to Carl and Joy and Eric, Ymer, Joshua. Good to see you guys uh, this morning. To Ray and the family. Um, Carl and Ann, Lily, uh, Alicia. Good to see you guys. Margo. To Beatrice. To John and to Luke uh, and the family. Good to see all of you guys. Good morning, Tracy. Good morning, Rihanna and Jamie. Uh, Karen, Allie, Danny, Mike, Igor. Good to see all of you guys. Um, really love that you guys are on and joining us this morning live. Uh, glad that you guys are in the chat. Uh, it's always good uh, both to see you, I guess, see your name and see your comments. Uh, and to see other people to know that we are still connected as much as we can be. I'm very thankful that we have technology to be able to do that uh, during this season. Uh, and so we want to keep utilizing it the best that we can. Uh, I've been so thankful for the patience of you guys in the Outlaws community uh, just as we uh, continue to navigate this season um, together. Good morning to Erica and Nina and Elizabeth. Good to see you guys. Glad that you guys are here. Uh, and part of what is going on. Uh, one real quick announcement uh, that we do have tonight uh, at seven o'clock, we are having our members meeting. Uh, and so that is um, both for 
uh, our church members. Uh, we have these a couple of times a year. But also, if you are not yet a church member, you can actually still come and join and observe and see what's going on. And so you are welcomed as well. Uh, we do have a couple of items that we'll be talking about. We'll be uh, talking about our potential new elders uh, that we uh, will be, or I guess we have candidates uh, for uh, becoming elders here at Ethnos. Uh, we'll also be doing a bit of an update on finances uh, and a possible adjustment to the budget regarding staff salaries. And so we'll be talking about those things and give you some updates on some other things going on. And so we look forward to that time. That'll be on Zoom. Um, the link was sent out by email uh, this week. And so if you didn't get that, let me know and I'll make sure that you have it. Uh, but um, otherwise, uh, I do want to continue forward with what we have planned for this morning. Uh, for our prayer time today, we usually stop in the middle of service uh, to pray for things that are going on uh, either in the ethnos community, in our local community, or in the worldwide community. Uh, and today we are going to be praying for our local small businesses uh, here in our area. But if you're joining from another city, uh, pray for the small businesses in your city as well. Uh, and today uh, we have a local restaurant owner. Uh, Pamela, whose heart, uh, she, she is a friend of Ethnos, um, and her heart um, is not only for her business, for all the people that are involved in her industry. Uh, when I was talking to her, uh, she is thinking about her workers. She's thinking about other people in uh, the supply chain. She's thinking about everyone that's been affected, uh, those, as small businesses have been affected in this season. So she's going to share a little bit how we can pray, uh, and then I will guide us in a little So I'd like to really thank you for coming in, Pastor Scott. It's just a pleasure to have you here. I think the ministry that you're offering is incredibly beautiful. Tears come to eyes. So thank you for doing that. And thank you, shout out to my friend Eric Lige, who's super amazing and how you got to know us anyway. So thanks for that. Um, I think what I'd like people to know about this prayer that you're offering is it's not just for my restaurant, it's for our community. And our community is so much wider than so many people think. It's a worldwide community. It may start here in Louisiana Food, but every person who comes in brings their community in, takes it back out with them. Our culture, our food, the richness of who we are, the grace of God that allows us to still be in business <laughs> and continue when, so sadly, so many people have not had that ability to maintain. And literally, that's a there by the grace of God moment for us. So when you're praying, it's so much more than a restaurant. It's everybody who works here. It's everybody who's a part of us. It's our chefs. It's our counter people. It's my family. <laughs> it's every part of us. And it's you. It's all of y'all who come in here. And we spread that out across the whole world, across the whole country. I said that reverse, but I think you know what I mean. It's starts here and it just goes. It's our shared humanity. COVID is the enemy of our very beings. And you can only do as much as you can do when you can help the people who are most at risk and the ones who are hardest hit. So in that way, we thank you for being here and taking this time to do this prayer with us. We are so grateful and we are so thankful to you and to Ethnos for putting this forward into your hearts and spreading it throughout the world, the ministry of music like you do anyway. So thank you so much for that. And what are some ways that we can be praying for you guys and other small businesses? That none of, nothing, that we keep everything so well maintained that when all of y'all come in, you take only the goodness of our food with you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that everything stays the best possible for you, for your, for your mental health, for your well-being. When people order from us, it's more than just ordering food, it's ordering something special. We're not, and thank God for all the other places that are there and available, but it's just so much more when you pray for us. It affects everything that we do. It's the blessings that we ask God for on our everyday, regular basis for our people, for their health, for their continued safety, and for the safety and love of the people who come in and support us as well, and take that joy out into the community with them. And do you have any needs specifically for your business that we pray for as well? 
honestly the biggest need is probably everybody's need in the small business community is not to close to stay open to stay in business and to com continue to be able to provide the good that we do for the people that we get to see and get to share with And so in talking uh, with Pamela, there's, it was very evident that her heart um, wasn't just for her, you know, place, it was for all of the restaurants and the businesses that are owned by families that uh, are connected to so many people. And so we want to be praying for them. We know uh, places have been so hard hit uh, during the COVID season. Uh, one other thing that she added on as well, uh, that you can pray specifically for their restaurant, uh, Louisiana, is that they um, are going to be forced to move uh, to a new location and so they are looking for a new location right now so you can also add that uh, to your prayer uh, also pray for other restaurants you know other small business owners that you might know uh, in your area and so we're going to join together in prayer uh, we'll give you some time to do that so you can do that as a group together with whoever you're watching with you can do that on your own uh, we'll give some space for that and then we'll come back together and pray um, all uh, together and so let's do that
Let's join together in prayer. God, we thank you for all of uh, the workers and business owners that make our neighborhoods happen, uh, serve people, uh, provide jobs. And yeah, we pray, God, because we know that during this season, it's been especially hard uh, for them. But we lift up to you, uh, restaurant owners like Pamela, others around the community, because I know, God, that they care not just about their own uh, places, but they care about everyone uh, around them. So we pray, God, that you would continue to provide, um, yeah, that there would be customers and places would be able to stay open, that they would both be able to um, be safe and follow um, the county's health protocols that they have been doing, but that they could also be able to continue to give quality services and products as they take pride in doing already. And we pray, God, that you continue to provide uh, for their families, for their workers' families. Yeah, God, we know there is so much need uh, during this season. Uh, we pray uh, specifically for uh, Pamela's restaurant as well as they search for a new location, God, uh, that that would be something you provide for them. We pray, God, for all of the community that's been affected, uh, not just uh, by COVID, but all of the uh, consequences of that uh, for the reduction of business and yeah, still everyone that's trying to just make it and get by. And so we lift them up to you, God, because we know you ultimately are the provider above uh, all of the uh, income and sales uh, and policies and provisions. God, you are ultimately the one that takes care of us. So we lift these prayers up to you, forward to how you are. For all in Jesus' name. Thank you for joining uh, together with us in prayer. Uh, one thing that was very clear uh, as I spent time uh, with Pamela this week uh, is that our local small business owners uh, are not just there to take care of their business. Uh, they're concerned for everything going on in the community as well. And so we talked uh, for a while about other things happening in our neighborhood, about other businesses and how people are affected by that. And so. Uh, continue to keep them in mind, uh, even as you think maybe about, I know some of you guys are in there talking about going out to lunch uh, afterwards. We've been there, you know, when we used to go to lunch together in person. Um, and so, uh, yeah, keep them, keep others in your prayers. Uh, you can also get ready. Uh, we are going to transition to our time uh, where we hear from God as well as talking to him. And to get us started with that, we have a question. So pick up your phones or keyboards or voice recognition. I don't know, however you type into the Facebook comment section. And uh, we have a question for you we would love to hear from. And the question is this. Have you ever had an injury that took a long time to heal? Uh, and so this could be something that you are currently dealing with. It could be something from a really long time ago and maybe that you're still dealing with or not dealing with anymore. Um, but have you ever had a physical injury uh, that took a long time to heal? Uh, and I know you can't tell your life story in a comment section, um, but if you have maybe a little bit about what happened uh, or how it went or how it was healed or not healed, uh, let us know. Uh, we would love to hear from you. We are live and we love interacting. Uh, and so that's why we utilize uh, Facebook so we can use our comment section uh, and have you guys post in there. Um, and I will jump in there in a moment. Uh, but yeah, when I think about the ideas of injuries, uh, and the long lasting effects that some of them have. Uh, I deal with that all the time, actually. I had uh, two knee surgeries when I was in high school. Uh, so I had just injuries from playing different sports. Um, and uh, even though I had corrective surgeries uh, and they took care of the problems, uh, there are still lingering issues years and years, many years now later. Uh, that includes both, you know, there's physical scars from having a surgery uh, and being cut open. Uh, but there's also the long lasting effects. Everything's not perfectly the way that it would have been before. Uh, and so as some of you guys know, sometimes I deal with uh, knee pain or um, yeah, have other parts of that that are hindering to me. Uh, and so there was both, yes, the time of healing uh, for that uh, and the way that it got better uh, and also still the lasting effects of that. So one of you guys have something similar. I'm going to hop into the comment section, see what people um, are talking about. And we are going to turn the comment section into an ER. <laughs> We've, I don't even 
I don't even know what PRK is, but PRK for eyes. Someone mentioned, someone mentioned their lower back surgery. Dislocated shoulder. If anyone, like, gets, like, a little, like, queasy when they hear about injuries, you might want to, like, mute this part. Um, meniscus tears in both knees. That does not sound good. Another e knee injury. Uh, strokes. Absolutely. Really bad ankle sprains. I've had a couple of those. Uh, wisdom teeth. Yeah. A back injury where someone fell off a ladder. Uh, and yeah, still has some of that acting up. Someone mentions breast cancer. I'm not going to read the jokes on here. Um, someone else mentions a broken finger. Um, absolutely. Uh, and so there are uh, certainly things uh, that we can think back. And one of the reasons we can think back uh, is because the recovery usually is not over. Uh, even if my knee was 100% at full strength, right, I would still have to be mindful of it in the future. Uh, see, someone else mentions uh, extensive foot surgery. You know, uh, and so we uh, have things in our lives that take time to heal. Now, why am I asking this question? Uh, we are talking about uh, this series called Disrupt, where we are thinking about how Jesus doesn't always just settle for the status quo, right? How he wants to bring about change uh, in this world. Um, and last week, we started a conversation uh, thinking about racism and our world uh, and how the church uh, can be a part, has been a part of it, and can be a part of the process. And today, we're going to talk about healing uh, and that God does have a desire to bring about healing on the topic of race. Uh, and that can seem like a very far off thing because we might look at our society and go like, how is this ever going to get better? Uh, when we think about it in terms of the injuries that have happened in this area, uh, those are things that have happened both to us and to others around us. Uh, and as we are talking about in the comment section right now, those things can take a long time to heal. Sometimes the wounds haven't healed uh, and maybe don't ever heal. Sometimes those wounds, even after they've healed, still have lasting effects. Uh, I actually think about Jesus in the Bible when I think about that. He uh, died on the cross. He rose from the grave. He gets a new body. He actually still had his scars, if you read the passage. He still had the markings uh, of his crucifixion in his hands. Uh, and so in the same way, our lives still bear uh, the consequences of injuries that we have had uh, in the past. And that's important for us to think about as we continue the discussion today about how do we heal uh, from the injuries that have happened, especially from racism? Uh, how can we individually heal and how are we part of collectively healing our world? Uh, and this is in the Disrupt series because uh, it's important that we just don't let things be and let them go and happen naturally. Uh, if you think about uh, some of these major injuries that you guys have listed, if we just kind of ignore it and just give it time, some people say time heals all wounds, we just give it time, uh, what can happen? Sometimes it might heal, yes, but a lot of time it'll heal maybe incorrectly or incompletely, uh, and we'll actually have ongoing issues uh, farther down the line if they're not addressed properly. Uh, in the same way, if racism is left just by itself and just given time, do we think it's going to heal naturally on its own? Uh, I think that the divides uh, caused by it, the harm caused by it, will continue to get worse and widen. Uh, and I think we can see that in our society now, because um, yes, I think a great thing right now is that more people are waking up to the reality of racism, at least here in the United States. Uh, but there are also, at the same time, many people uh, who are digging their heels in uh, in denying that these things exist or ignoring the pain caused. And so when we think about how are things going to change, they're going to change when we don't just let them happen, uh, but we disrupt the status quo. And today we're talking about how the goal of that is, uh, yes, in reversing the effects of racism, but even going a step further and talking about how do we bring about healing in our world. Jesus wants to disrupt our trajectories. 
that's part of this series as well. And for some of us, uh, we've been on a path where we just let things happen. We ignore them. Uh, we hope that if we don't pay attention to them, that they'll go away or that they'll get better on their own. Uh, but many times in our lives, God actually wants to redirect our paths uh, to get us on a path to wholeness that he wants to bring about in our lives. Uh, God's plan for us is an ongoing process of healing. Uh, you can see that in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, uh, where it says, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And so that is talking about how the work that Jesus does in our lives started when we let him into our lives to be a part of us, uh, but it keeps going. It's an ongoing process that he keeps working at, and he promises he's going to complete it, but it's not going to be fully completed uh, until the day that he returns. And so there is this process of healing and growth that he has in mind for all of us, uh, no matter where we are in this conversation. Uh, and uh, I find it inspiring that the Bible, inspiring and interesting, the Bible at the very last chapter, Revelation chapter 22, and the end of the story after Jesus comes back, he's victorious. He is remaking heaven and earth. Uh, if you read Revelation 22 verse 3, there's still some healing actually needs to take place. Part of uh, how he's going to give life to this world is through the river of life. But he also says there's some leaves on some trees that are going to be for the healing of the nations. There is still going to be recovery. And so we're going to talk about that healing process today, um, both for us individually, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that, and why that is necessary for our corporate collective uh, healing as well. God does have a plan for healing and redemption uh, from the sin of racism. Uh, and that's what we want to look at. Uh, we do recognize, though, that different people uh, are going to need different things uh, because of the different roles that we have played. And so God has some different steps for us. Some of us uh, have been the ones suffering the effects of racial discrimination and bias uh, and violence. Uh, some have maybe been a part of carrying it out uh, or supporting those who do. Some maybe have benefited uh, from uh, the effects of racism and been unaware of that. Some have maybe known about it, but have stood by silently. Uh, and so what are we supposed to take from this? Uh, first, I want to acknowledge uh, not everyone who is a majority culture uh, who is white uh, is racist, right? It doesn't mean that everyone who is part of a necessary people group has individual things uh, that they are guilty. Uh, benefiting uh, from uh, inequalities, right? Having privilege uh, doesn't mean that an individual is necessarily privileged. And I think that's where we get mixed up. In our society, privileged means maybe someone that grew up in a very rich family, never had any problems, uh, or was spoiled always had life easy. And that's not always true. There's a lot of people uh, from all different cultures that have struggled very much. It also doesn't mean, uh, benefiting doesn't mean that we didn't put in a lot of hard work uh, and that we didn't uh, do things uh, that were necessary to achieve what we have achieved. Uh, what it does mean uh, is that there are dynamics in this world where some people are treated differently than others. And sometimes we benefit from them, even if we didn't ask to, uh, even if we didn't uh, want to, uh, it recognizes that that is true. And so as we think about how each of us might uh, have a part that we have played, uh, I believe that God has something for all of us. Uh, it's going to be different uh, depending on what our experiences have been uh, and what position we find ourselves in. Uh, but uh, I believe that. Uh, these different things that he has is going to bring all of us uh, together. And so we're going to talk about that. What does healing look like uh, for some different people? Uh, and first, I want to address those uh, who have been harmed uh, and continue to be harmed by racism. Uh, if that's not you, uh, there are some other steps I'm going to talk about later, but it's actually really important for you to listen in for how the church uh, is supposed to be a part of this process. So first, uh, for black 
indigenous uh, and peoples of color. Uh, and someone used the term in the comments, um, BIPOC last week. Stands, it, that's what it stands for, Black Indigenous Peoples of Color. Uh, and it's a specific term that's actually used to recognize that there are, um, yes, all people of color who are not white, right, do have some certain experiences, but some of those experiences are different. Some people have experienced racism in more specific and direct ways, uh, particularly the black uh, community in America because of our history of slavery um, and all of the uh, after effects of slavery and way things have been perpetuated afterwards. Uh, and also for indigenous peoples, for the native groups uh, here, uh, at least in the United States, uh, because of the history uh, from the government and from others of uh, breaking treaties, of genocide, of stealing land. It also recognizes that there are some people groups that face maybe more discrimination uh, than others, even in our current day. Um, hate crimes uh, and immigration issues for Muslims, for example, or the internment camps that the Japanese faced uh, during World War II. And so we recognize that not everyone has uh, the same experiences, um, but for those uh, who do have and bear the weight of those things in the past, uh, what does Jesus have for us? Uh, one framework that I have found uh, really helpful recently in thinking about the effects of racism is to think about it in terms of trauma. Trauma uh, and racial trauma that we are talking about today uh, recognizes that the things are not just a one-time event, right? It's not just one thing happens to us, then we move on, and then another thing happens to us, and that they are separate incidents. But it's that repeated experience of racial discrimination and racial violence have lasting, long-term cumulative effects on us. Uh, they can cause things like fatigue and anxiety, anger, shame. Sometimes it might cause us to uh, be silent and hold things in. Uh, sometimes it might uh, lead to us finding other ways to cope uh, that are not always healthy. Uh, it may uh, turn into acts of anger and violence against others, or it might turn into turning that anger on ourselves. Uh, trauma recognizes uh, that uh, these things are long-term damaging. They're not just single events that we can get over. First, I do want to say this should never have had to be any of yours to bear. No one should have had to face uh, the consequences. And so it sucks and I want to say I'm sorry uh, that you've had to experience those things. God calls it a sin. Uh, it's an affront to uh, his design to create all of humanity in his image. All be treated equally, to all be loved. by him. But God doesn't just leave us in that, as wrong as it has been. The good news of Jesus is that he has a path of healing and recovery. Uh, and I'm going to uh, use a framework uh, from a book that I find helpful, and I do recommend this book to you. Uh, it's called um, Healing Racial Trauma. Uh, and so I'm going to put up on the screen uh, five um, kind of steps or items. This isn't the whole book, um, but part of how Sheila Wise Rowe helps us get on a path of healing. And so this is for the individual work. If you have dealt with the trauma of racism, if you still feel the effects of that, uh, here are some steps uh, that she finds helpful, and all of these things uh, you know, are biblical uh, concepts as well. And so the five things that she mentions, uh, how do we heal individually the effects of racism? Uh, one, she talks about soul repair. Uh, and soul repair is about identifying and the causes uh, or the ways that racism has caused moral injuries to us, uh, the ways that it's harmed our soul, the ways it's caused us maybe to think different things about God, maybe doubting that God is there, uh, maybe to become angry at God, uh, how uh, we've seen betrayal in our lives around us. And when we are betrayed, we lose trust. We lose trust of ourselves. We lose trust of others. We lose trust of God. Uh, it affects uh, maybe how we've seen right or wrong in this world. Uh, it's affected uh, how we can believe in institutions that are supposed to protect us, right? Um, police are supposed to protect us. 
The government is supposed to protect us. Churches are supposed to protect us. And when those places actually cause us harm instead, uh, that is deeply uh, hurting to us. And so recognizing these things is a, and identifying them is a really important part of understanding how we have been harmed. Because when we recognize how we've been hurt, uh, that's the first step uh, to being able to find healing. Uh, and so uh, that soul repair, recognizing that we've been hurt, uh, that other people have done things that have caused us uh, damage uh, or brokenness, is on the path to how Jesus wants to help repair. The second area uh, that she mentions then is reversing transgenerational trauma. Uh, that the cycles of racism uh, bear effects on us, and that has been true throughout all of history. Uh, those things are still ongoing now to this day. Uh, but that, uh, that also then, the ways we uh, become injured affects the people around us, affects the way we raise our kids, the way we interact with our family members. Uh, and so how do we go about reversing some of that trauma and the effects? Uh, and some of these things I think many of you guys are already doing. Uh, but she mentions that part of the process is in, involves finding safe people, safe places. Uh, places where we can feel like we're at home. Places where we feel welcomed, where maybe we weren't welcomed before. Places where if we're rejected in this world, where we are accepted for being who we are. Uh, places and people where uh, if others have taken away our dignity, uh, where instead there are people who are affirming our dignity, uh, affirming our value, uh, affirming our identity as people created in the image of God. Uh, and so part of that healing comes through finding people who... Now, you are probably already doing this uh, because you can probably tell who are the people I can trust, who are the people who I cannot trust. Uh, unfortunately, uh, many times that is found in only the people groups who are like us because they have similar experiences. Ideally, in God's design, it should be the church. It should be God's people. Uh, the Bible talks about God and uh, his place of worship, his temple, and us as people being a place of sanctuary, being a place of safety, being a place of healing, uh, being a place of acceptance and empowerment, which we talked about last week. And so uh, looking out for those people uh, is part of how we heal. It's especially important because when we have had negative experiences with certain types of people before in the past, the healing process is going to, be, is going to come from finding positive experiences uh, with some people like that. Uh, when you find someone from majority culture, uh, who's a friend, who is willing to listen, uh, who is an ally in standing up, uh, who is an accomplice in trying to change our systems of inequality. Uh, when you can find those positive experiences, uh, that is going to be part of undoing negative ones. For everyone else that's listening into this section, that's why God calls us, the church, to be places where all people, not are just there, not just that are present, but are welcomed, uh, but are empowered, but are fully embraced, uh, just as much as everyone. I hope that you've been finding that at Ethnos, and that you can find that in more as well. And so positive experiences uh, help us heal from the negative experiences. Uh, third uh, is the idea of telling the whole story. Uh, and this can actually be very painful at first. Uh, but when we avoid talking about the bad parts of our history, and this has happened in a lot of families that I know uh, as well, uh, we ignore the parts of the past that were painful, the parts that we don't want to talk about, the parts that we're ashamed of. What happens is we actually miss the beautiful parts of this. We miss out on the positive things that have come about from it. And so being honest with our past and with our history and the ways that we've been harmed uh, is important 
uh, to understanding how God has actually been present all along. In the ways that we have been harmed, God was there fighting. Uh, even though we've had a lot taken away from us, uh, God was still giving us things to be grateful for. Uh, even though we felt abandoned by many people, God has never forgotten us. And so uh, recognizing that there is a whole story. There are parts that we don't want to talk about. Uh, and if you have uh, been to therapy, it's those parts that are actually really important uh, because it helps us identify the pain and expose it so that we can eventually. Uh, fourth on her list is working through forgiveness. Now, I know forgiveness can be a really hard word uh, when we think about uh, this topic. Uh, let me tell you uh, what it means, first of all. Uh, forgiveness uh, is not talking about forgetting or ignoring the things that have happened. Uh, the word forgiveness is actually about release and letting go. Uh, and especially uh, in this area, it's to release our grasp on things like fear and anger and hatred. Because when we don't address those things, they turn into unforgiveness which can turn into bitterness. When we let our anger uh, go unresolved and turn into hate, uh, it actually, we think it's going to hurt the people who harmed us, but it actually ends up hurting ourselves. The people who oppress us in this world will continue to oppress us in our hearts. We don't deal with that anger. Uh, and that's especially true because if we are always waiting uh, for other people to make amends, to apologize, to change, uh, to come back uh, and repent before us, what happens if they never do? We know that a lot of times that's not going to come. But when we are waiting on them, it actually leaves the power in their hands. Right? Our healing shouldn't have to wait for other people to apologize to us, make those changes. Letting go of that anger that takes the power out of their hands, places it back on our side. And so when we are letting go of the anger, and I don't mean that we're not going to become angry, um, it's a question of what do we do with the anger when it comes up. Uh, and the Bible talks about placing that not in our hands, but turning it over to God. Uh, Romans 12, 19, I'll just read that for us, says, Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. The reason that we can even think about the concept of forgiveness and letting go of the anger and the hate is because God says he is the one that's ultimately responsible for justice. He is the one that is ultimately in charge of making sure that everyone pays for everything, that everything is remade. And so letting go of the anger doesn't mean we're not going to keep seeking justice. It doesn't mean uh, that we are not going to keep trying to make change in this world. It means that the responsibility of that is ultimately on God, not on us. We're still going to be involved in the process, but it's his to worry about, not ours. So that means when justice isn't met, it's not because we didn't do enough. It's not because we weren't strong enough. Uh, it's because we are just still waiting on God. His timing. And I know this concept is hard. I can't speak as a person who uh, has black heritage or uh, is part of an indigenous people's group. All I can speak is as a pastor. And I've seen this time and time again. You have every right to hold on to the anger. You have every right that you're prerogative. Uh, and I think everyone would understand if you did that. But when we choose that path, we won't experience the full healing and redemption that Jesus desires for us. We're going to miss out on part of what he wants to do in our lives. The goal of forgiveness isn't to forget the past. It's not to ignore the past. It's to create a future for us that involves restoration, that involves redemption. 
again, holding on to the anger, holding on to the bitterness doesn't hurt other people. It only hurts ourselves. And so my goal as a pastor uh, is to give everyone that hope of a life that God has created each of us. And he has that for you. And I want you to be able to experience And that leads to uh, that fifth item on the list, uh, post-traumatic growth. And it's the idea that actually so trauma shouldn't happen, right? And uh, inequalities shouldn't happen and oppression should not happen. Uh, but many people who have experienced that actually come out stronger than people who haven't. That there are ways that we can grow from that uh, and actually experience some goodness. Again, it doesn't mean it should have happened that way. But Genesis chapter 50 verse 20 uh, says this, even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good. The quote from Joseph, who was betrayed by his brothers, uh, who was beaten and left to die, uh, and yet he recognized that even though sometimes people want that what happened to him was because people wanted to hurt him. Sometimes God actually uses that to make us stronger, to make us more resilient. Uh, people who have experienced that type of suffering are some of the strongest people that I know. Uh, they are people with the most endurance, uh, with the most uh, sometimes patience, uh, with the most strength in responding to adversity. Uh, and so uh, that is part of how God wants to bring healing in our lives. That's my hope. That's what I want to see for you, for all people who have been hurt. Now, how does this fit in with everybody else? How does this fit in uh, with uh, maybe people who don't have those same experiences? Uh, for everyone else that's been listening, right, if these are the things that are needed for those who have been hurt, uh, that's part of what the rest of us are called to bring about, who we are supposed to become as the people of God to help in the healing process. And so for those who have benefited from racism or been part of perpetuating it, uh, what are some steps that we can take? And I say this uh, not just, again, for people who are white. I think this includes anyone uh, who has benefited. Um, and so that, yes, can include the dominant culture. That can also include uh, a lot of other people groups uh, who have been on the side of enjoying uh, benefits as well. Uh, and so two concepts uh, that, again, come from uh, that same book on healing racial trauma. Uh, and there are, I think, multiple parts to this. Um, but to simplify it, uh, two items, repentance and repair. One, God calls us to repentance, right? Uh, all of us have the option, right? When we are presented with the idea that racism has existed, some of us have participated in it, some of us have benefited from it. And even if we didn't individually, it still exists in our world. We have the choice. Do we recognize it and do we repent? Repentance has a couple of steps. Repentance is the idea of understanding what has happened. What was the reality? Oh, what was real? And that happens through things like learning and listening to other people. Uh, because if we don't recognize what truly happened, we can't lament, can't uh, repent. We can't actually create change. Uh, and so we actually have to recognize what really happened. Uh, and as someone mentioned last week very helpfully in the comments, uh, in today's world, uh, this is something that you can do on your own. Un growing an understanding, uh, there are so many things that you can read, that you can learn about uh, to understand uh, the history of racism, for instance, in this country. Um, or if you're in other places or know people from other places, how is it uh, played out uh, where uh, other cultures are from? And as we grow in that understanding, uh, we will become more informed so we have an accurate view. Uh, that includes listening as well to the stories of people who have been talking about these things for a long time. Uh, there's been lots of periods of my life where I just didn't hear those stories uh, or didn't uh, 
pay close enough attention to them. Um, but as I've done that more, I've gotten a bigger, fuller picture uh, of what the reality is. And that's important, important because uh, of the second step. Uh, that should lead us then to a reflection, to ask this question, well, if this is the reality, what's my place in it? Uh, that can mean, how have I participated? Uh, that can be, how have I stood by in silence uh, when things have gone on? Uh, that could be, how have I just focused on myself and not what was happening for other people? That could be, uh, what are the parts of bias that exist in me? Uh, the ways that I view people, do I view them differently? What are the standards of beauty and the way that I view those in the world? What is the potential that I see in each person when I see them walking on the street rather than that work or at school? And so to reflect deeply on, yeah, what part of this is inside of me? And uh, a quick warning, that can be very jarring, right? That can cause a lot of guilt and maybe shame, uh, maybe anger. Uh, and those emotions are actually important to pay attention to because those are the emotions of lament, right? To recognize that there has been injustice in this world, that there are things that are not right and they should have happened. but. Uh, it's also important because recognizing those things is part of how we can be part of the solution. And that's the last part of repentance. Repentance really means change. Uh, repentance is uh, not just saying sorry. Sometimes when we hear repent, we just like apologize, right? And we say like, oh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, and, and we leave it at that. Repentance is actually the idea of turning in the other direction making a u-turn and going in the opposite way of what we were going before uh, and that change uh, are things that needs to happen both individually and corporately that i commit in my life uh, to being different to not carrying out the things maybe that i carried out before or to not sit silently uh, when things have happened and that also uh, includes corporately and uh, I think this is important because in Western culture, a lot of times we think very individually. And so if I didn't, as my own choices and my own experience, I didn't uh, carry out, say, some acts of racism, I didn't say certain things, I didn't create the systems that exist, we think it's not our problem and we don't have anything to do about it. Um, but that's actually not how it works in the Bible. Uh, the Bible calls all people to repent of sin as a group because sometimes uh, these things happen on our watch, they happen in our people, they happen in our community, even when it wasn't me individually. And that's because we can all have a role and should have a role. The second part, uh, repair. And so in repentance and repair, repair is about reversing uh, what has happened, reversing the effects of racism. Uh, and so it's not good enough just to say, okay, I need to commit to not being racist. Uh, that also means we need to talk about how we undo the effects of racism, become anti-racist, to eliminate it in our society. And I would say the Bible calls us even to a step further than being. And that's to be healers, reconcilers, to be part of bringing people back together, ultimately to experience God and his beauty, and to do that through. And so we're part of reversing racism and then creating a new future a future where all people are seen together where your people become my people we are all one humanity we're all created in god uh, we all make sure that is affirmed in our church communities and the wider community we create a new world where all people uh, are affirmed no person is left out uh, and uh, the broken systems that once caused harm can't be a part of it. Now, these processes that we mentioned, uh, you notice I've been talking so much about the individual work and what we do internally. And I think that's important uh, because the individual healing is important for us to bring about collective corporate healing. Uh, when we go in to engage uh, whether it's in activism, whether it's in conversations about uh, racism, uh, whether it's in trying to create new structures, and we do that from a place of our brokenness, haven't uh, had some healing, then we actually could end up doing more harm uh, than good. Ideally, together as a church and as a society, we all recognize our roles to play in it 
we recognize how we uh, can be changed and how that change come about. And so I hope this is helpful. I know there's a lot of things I haven't covered. I know there are multiple paradigms and ways to think about these things. Um, but uh, yeah, I wanted to give uh, a primer or some uh, summary of what are some of these processes, because I believe that God does have something for all of us. God has a path, a path of wholeness, a path of healing, a path uh, of beauty that is both for our own lives, but also for the world around us. And I think this is an important part of how God gets. Well, I'm going to pause because uh, I'm sure you have a bunch of comments or questions. And so we're going to hop on to the comment section. Uh, my wife, Lydia, who's been following along um, and is in the comment section on Facebook, uh, is going to read off some of the questions and comments, uh, and we will talk about them. Yeah. And so do we have some things ready to go? Um, this was actually during your message, like the latter end of the message, and it's not necessarily for Q&A, but I thought it was um, it was just something I wanted to to highlight. Um, so the individual says post-traumatic growth is an ongoing process, especially when you're always still in the process of experiencing the impact of racism constantly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's actually uh, one of the reasons, one, that the trauma exists in the first place, um, but why this is actually, it's so deep um, as well, um, because it's not a type of trauma that you can escape in this world, right? Uh, is racism like ever going to be fully eliminated? I don't think so before Jesus comes in. And so it's a little bit different. Um, you might have had trauma from the past, maybe a situation you were in with a parent or, you know, someone else where like things were caused or harm was caused. Maybe, it, you know, it was a war in your homeland. And then you were, are out of that situation later in your life. And so uh, in those cases, right, the trauma, the, the, the harm is stopped. Uh, at least outwardly. And with racism, that's never going to be true. Uh, and that's why I think it's important, um, even more important, to actually engage in different parts of the process because uh, if we don't and we just let things keep going, we're going to keep receiving that harm. It shouldn't be that way again. Uh, it is wrong. It's an injustice. But that's how we eventually, I think, find not just healing, but also strength and resilience. I, there's just there's just so many layers and so much and um want to share with you guys like Scott and I were talking um yesterday about this but just how there's there's just there's just so much content and I think so many thoughts and feelings and systems um and how like just just this little bit of you know um that we're talking about here and discussing and processing it doesn't even touch the depth of, um, yeah, just, just the depth of this and just wanted, wanted to acknowledge that, wanted to acknowledge that, um, I think grieving is ongoing. Um, and, um, yeah. And, and I, I really like that you had shared earlier that like, yeah, forgiveness is an option and that is something that, you know, like it, it's, it's good for us, um, to do that. But at the same time, it also makes sense that, one would still feel a lot of anger and feel that despair, um, especially if it just keeps happening over and over again. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I just want to acknowledge the complexity. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I literally, even in the material I've been looking at, <laughs> this is like a small, tiny snippet. And so again, I recommend uh, the book Healing Racial Trauma uh, from Sheila Wise Rowe. Also, uh, one of the community groups um, has been doing a book called The Roadmap to Reconciliation 2.0, uh, Brenda Salton McNeil. And so that is a great book that talks about some of that overall process too, and how we can play a role uh, in undoing uh, structures of racism. I also like reading biographies um, by, by folks who um, are Black American and um, also, you know, by other um people of color as well and autobiographies as well and just learning their stories learning about mm -hmm. um their perspectives and a lot of times just seeing how you know our history that's been told to us right and it's been recorded in our history books just is not as incomplete or has maybe just hasn't you know told it um what was true at all 
Yeah. Um, and so just like another, yeah, another resource. Yeah. I was going to say, um, did send out an email this week. So if you get the weekly ethnos email, uh, we did send them links to some articles and resources. Uh, if you are maybe learning the basics of systemic racism or learning definitions or want to kind of know uh, what's going on. So there's some resources both from UCSD and San Diego State uh, University. Um, but the stories that Lady is talking about are great too. Tomorrow, February 1st, is actually the start of Black History Month. And so uh, I think it's a great thing to, for everyone to seek out some uh, new knowledge, history, uh, stories that maybe we didn't know about before. And I have like a dozen of them that I could name off the top of my head right now, but we don't have time. <laughs> yeah, you could just do the public library. That's what I do. Like, yeah. so I'm not paying money. <laughs> um, but yeah, just uh, there's just so much. And if you actually now with COVID, um, they have a pretty lucrative, lucrative system going on, I think, on the public library website where you can actually review books. And I'm not sure if this was, you know, present before COVID, but certainly um, now, you know, everyone uses it and you can um, actually reserve books um, and pick them up. It's very yeah. easy to do. Um, yeah, accessible. Um, there's a question here that says, what does being a Christian focused on racial healing look like when a lot of Christians um, don't focus on that? Or gaslight slash ignore the problem. Indeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I fully recognize there's this big chunk I didn't talk about. I didn't talk about how do we have conversations with people who don't believe in racism. Uh, and so your question acknowledges that, right? Especially even in the church. And there are a lot of churches that don't talk about the topic or will deny that it exists. I think uh, what I'm coming to in, in this area is you know there's a lot of times where jesus gets rejected right his message gets rejected he's going around telling people the good news of the kingdom of god and people just won't have it they won't respond uh, and so they won't repent right they don't see that change is needed they don't see they've done anything wrong and jesus tells his disciples to like move on to the next town like they in, in our culture it'd be like you know you shake your you wipe your hands of this uh and the phrasing in the bible is like they shake the dust off their feet or off their sandals and they move on saying all right you chose to say no to this i let you know about it and i've done my job and i'm going to go move on to some people who will be receptive to it uh, and i'm starting to believe that's the response um and i know some of you guys have already taken that response uh in this area right um now it's hard when it's something like family members or our church communities that we're in community with uh and i think those could be more difficult uh, I think being gentle uh, in our approach, uh, just in terms of our affect, right, and like how we talk about things. I don't think people respond really well when you yell like you're racist or like you're wrong, right? Like people don't respond to those types of things. Um, there are some uh, resources, I think it might have been in one of the links that we sent out this week, but um, I think presenting information uh, as matter of factly as we can. Um, but also, I think what Lydia was talking about, pointing to stories, uh, are actually a great entry point because it's hard to deny. It's easy to like explain away statistics, but it's harder to deny someone's individual. Um, I, one more layer to that question that uh, you mentioned is like, what do we do as Christians with other Christians, right? Should churches be telling other churches? Uh, should I be talking to my friend that goes to another church, right, about topic of racism? Um, I think yes, um, but I think, it, again, needs to be done carefully. From my perspective, actually, it's actually a conversation I should be having with, like, other pastors more. Uh, because, to me, uh, the biggest responsibility on what happens in churches comes down to the teachers, right, and the leaders. And the Bible does the same thing. It talks about the people who are most responsible are the people who have been t saying stuff and guiding their people. And we've seen, I think, you know, in recent history, how much leaders uh, saying certain things will be believed by the followers. Uh, and so I think that's true in churches as well. There's some people where these things never get talked about. And so it just might never popped up on the radar, right? That can be innocent for a member. Um, but I think it should be on the leaders uh, to dig into this more. Um, I don't remember if I said this on air last week. I've been encouraging... Uh, my majority culture pastor friends, I've been encouraging the ones that have been speaking out because I think that's one of the most important things uh, is for them to recognize and to speak to their congregations uh, about this topic. And so more and more of doing it. So I would say there's hope. I've definitely seen more in the last year or so than I did 
in the previous however many years of my life. Um, and so I think that there is change coming. But yeah, it's slow work. And I know some of you guys are tired out from it. And you just need to like hang out. It shouldn't have been yours to fight for. I One thing I left out is like in the Bible, God never calls the oppressed to fight for themselves. Right? Like he doesn't say, hey, widows and orphans, how come you're not taking care of yourselves? Like he says, everyone else, it's your job to go care for the widow, the orphan, the foreigner, uh, the sick and injured, uh, the poor. It's on the rest of God's people to go do the fighting for them. And so that's why it's on everyone else to actually be involved. Even if you weren't involved before, if you were in a place now where it exists, you are now involved. Uh, and it's on all of us. Uh, one person says, I see white privilege. I believe there's inequality. So I took the Black Mind Black Minds Matter course. And thank you, Adora and Luke. Um, and I've donated to charities uh, specifically helping communities of color during Christmas this year. And now I want to do more. So I'm constantly thinking, now what's uh, next to aid in reconciliation? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. Let me see who's. Yeah. yeah. I would say if um, there's actually something really important, if you guys are from a majority culture or you have access uh, to people from majority culture, you are actually some of the best voices in speaking up about racism, right? And recognizing that. And I know maybe don't start with family because I know sometimes that has issues. Um, but when you, let's say, share things on social media or speak up, it actually says a lot more than someone who's, let's say, a black person saying that Black Lives Matter, right? When white people started saying that, uh, it's not to say like they should get all the glory or they're the heroes or anything, because they're definitely not, all right? But it actually... Um, other people are going to listen to it for better or for worse. It shouldn't happen that way. Um, but your voice is going to be heard more. Same thing if I'm speaking to another pastor, they're going to listen to me more uh, just because I'm a pastor, right? And they're going to respect that a little bit more. Uh, and so what is actually needed most is people who are majority culture, who are in places of influence uh, to be bringing these things forefront. Um, on that note, speaking about two folks, um, says, Scott, what's the vibe you're getting from pastors who aren't talking about racism in their church? So um, I think there's a couple of things. I think the vast majority of, let's say, pastors and churches are trying to do the right thing, right? And they have great intentions um, and they're trying to do what's right and true. And there's a lot of people in majority culture. So one thing... Um, and I'm sure some of you guys can speak to this. I'm not white, but uh, there's a lot of people who just honestly were just ignorant, meaning unaware of the realities of everything going on, right? Especially you could grow up in a place where there's not a lot of minorities um, and just in your experience, you might not encounter the things. And so there's a lot of people, I think, who genuinely just were unaware and they thought maybe it's this fringe thing. Uh, maybe, you know, just some people are speaking up about it. Uh, but like Lydia mentioned, you know, our history books have been uh, like cleansed of these things. They don't tell all the stories. Uh, it's not popular in our culture. And so, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of people that just don't know. I think, and I say that because I think the vibe I'm getting, I think there's a lot more people who are internally asking questions. For every, let's say, white pastor who speaks up, there's handfuls more that I think are thinking about it and they're trying to figure out how to. They're either learning, right, or they're figuring out then how to bring it up. Um, there are some, I think, who are maybe in full denial, but I actually honestly don't think it's that many. Um, I think a lot of it is actually uh, who, like, it's hard to bring it up in a place where, again, the status quo has been a certain thing for a certain amount of time. Uh, I, do, I know a white pastor who had a white church, uh, decided he was convicted about diversity and racism and said, we need to welcome people better and become a multicultural church, he lost half of his congregants, right? Half of the people in the church left. A lot of pastors know that's going to be the reality. If they speak up on certain issues, they could have that type of thing happen. And so it's, uh, it's not just as simple as speak up because it's right, even though it probably should be. Um, but yeah, so it's a great question. Uh, we can go into more details. You can talk to me afterwards. I, I have a lot to say in that area. Um, but yeah, thanks for the questions. Is there anything else pressing? Yeah, 
Yeah, I think this is a um, this is what okay. we should address. Last one. Um, how do we respond to people who say the damage done wasn't done by me um, or by my recent ancestors? So, like, why do I have to be the one held accountable and to fix the problem? Yeah. So I would say first of all, um, not everyone is individually responsible uh, in the same way as someone that carried out things. And so I think. Um, that's actually what I hear from a lot of white people. A lot of white people will say, as soon as this thing comes up, I'm labeled as racist. Um, yet I didn't actually do these things. I didn't build these systems. I didn't own a slave, those type of things, right? Uh, and so I actually think that's actually an important distinction. Right? Again, not every white person then is racist or has carried out these things. Um, but to the question of like, how, why are we all responsible? It's because we actually, one, all benefit and two, by just existing in the status quo and letting things happen, we actually end up perpetuating it. And that's why systems are so important um, of racism. Uh, I cut out a section. I was going to show a map. Maybe I'll post it later. Um, so, for instance, if you live in San Diego, uh, something I just learned a couple of years ago. So redlining, um, the practice uh, a century ago of discriminating in housing and who could get mortgages, who can live in what neighborhoods uh, based on race actually happened in San Diego and had a profound effect. Uh, I looked at the map, the redlining map of San Diego, what areas were, they zoned them by like numbers, but it was really by race, right? Where were white people allowed to live? Where were non-white people allowed to live? Mm. And you look at that map and you recognize the map if you currently live in San Diego. The map's from 1936 or 38, something It's not like even that. that long ago. Right. Yeah. But you can see the neighborhood lines and you can recognize, yeah, our city is segregated. It is majority, you know, 90% white people that live in this neighborhood. Uh, and it is majority of like minorities that live in these other neighborhoods. And you can see the socioeconomic differences in those neighborhoods as well. Um, and so all of us have lived in the effects of it. Even again, if we didn't individually um, create these things or perpetuate them. Uh, and so we all are a part of that system question is then how can all of us be part of changing it again some people are going to say no some people are going to say i don't see it or i don't think i'm responsible so i'm not going to do anything about it uh, and if enough people do that it's going to continue the way it's been but if enough people say i do want to be a part of change and i want something different it eventually will change it sucks that it's so slow but that's how it's got to go so thank you for all the questions i know there's more things we could be talking about um, I'm thankful to you guys uh, for everyone who has said, and I found that at Ethnos, I've been very encouraged. There's so many people who are like, yes, uh, this is something that I want to be a part of changing. Uh, you've been doing that internal work uh, individually, uh, and you're part of creating a community where people can feel safe uh, and feel welcomed. And so you guys are all a part of that. Um, yeah, so we're going to continue reflecting on how we can do that. Um, just as you are asking those questions, uh, we're going to go to our closing song because uh, it reflects on how God is the one who's going to make the change. God is the one who is going to bring about change in our own lives um, and how he's going to not only work in us, but use us and move through us uh, in this. So you continue to reflect in singing or you can just listen. But yeah, let's continue on. still being moved and strongholds are still being lost God we believe and yes we can see that wonders are still what you do montañas se moverán cadenas se Dios lo creemos y si lo veremos, milagros que solo haces tú.
to uh, Nikki and Genesis for that song. We do need a move. Let's close in prayer. God, we recognize every day just how much more we need you. So we pray, God, that you would come, you would do your thing, both in our lives, ways that you're trying to show us, how you're trying to create change and heal, get us to move, and also in the ways that you're moving in this world. We look forward to all that you're going to do because we believe you guys, you, <laughs> you have a beautiful picture of what you're going to do. We await the day when we see it fully realized. Draw us in the name of Jesus. Well, thank you uh, for joining with us. Uh, thank you for being a part of the conversation, uh, all of these conversations. Uh, you are an important part of the community, no matter who you are, uh, and that's important that to always recognize. Uh, and so we are going to uh, leave you with one closing video from uh, Urbana 18, which is over two years ago now. Uh, but uh, Eric uh, led a team uh, for a, a multicultural uh, student missions conference. Uh, and so we're going to leave you with one song. Uh, that recognizes that God is king. Uh, so if you have time, you can stick around for that. Otherwise, uh, we will see you guys next week. Enjoy the time. I think some of you guys might be eating lunch together. <laughs> we'll see you.